Thanks so much, Danny. We appreciate it. Um, we are so happy to see you all here and appreciate you taking the time to learn more about the Department of Resident Life and the Maryland Residential Experience. Again, my name is Jasmine Pless, and I am the Manager for Communications and Outreach within the Department of Resident Life. And we are joined by a panel of colleagues here, all of whom are excited to share with you all the variety of all the housing options that we have available here at the University of Maryland. Um, these include our residence halls and our public private apartments. And this is all with the goal of you all becoming more informed in the decision that you'll be making about housing for next year. And we really, really hope that you all see all the options that we have here available and choose to stay on here with us at the University of Maryland. So we'll begin uh, this webinar by introducing the other folks that we have here on the panel, in addition to myself. Um, so I invite Tiffany to say a little bit more about her. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Tiffany Gaines Lequeme. I serve as the Associate Director for University Housing Partnerships. Um, one of my major areas of responsibility is to oversee the resident life component over in our 1P3 property, South Campus Commons. Um, I oversee the off-campus housing services office um, and just work as a liaison between all of that. Linda, can you introduce yourself? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Linda Dye. I am a public inquiry coordinator here in the Office of Assignments and Public Inquiry in the Department of Resident Life. Um, I've been with the department for, or rather since 2013. Um, and am a uh, University of Maryland alum. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here with you today. My name is Tracy Kiris. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Director for Strategic Communications and Marketing, and I have been um, at the University of Maryland for about 28 years, and I'm excited to get to know you a little more today. Wonderful. And on that note, we would love to hear more about who is joining us here today. So we're going to initiate a poll to learn more about you. Um, so please take a moment to let us know, are you a student? Are you a family member? And if you are a student, please share what year you are um, so we can get to know a little bit more about who is in the room with us today. So we'll give you a moment to make your selections and we'll go from there. And Danny, I believe you'll see the results of that on your end, if I'm correct. Oh, and it's popping up. It seems like we have a majority of family members here in the room, also with some students. So it's great to see that we have a mix of folks that are joining us here today. And we have a great amount of information to share all of the housing, housing options that we have available. So next, we'll take a look at our agenda to go over all of the topics that we'll be covering here today with you all. on our next slide. Sorry, it's doing the poll now for uh, if you're a student oh. um, or what year okay, you're a student. Great. Wonderful. And I'll share so that I'll in just a, a second. Great, so we'll get to see what students we have here with us today. Great to see that we have a significant number of first year students, some sophomores, some juniors and some seniors. So we have the whole run of the gambit and this is amazing because we'll share information that will be pertinent to all classes of students here at the university. So on that note, we'll go through our agenda so that you guys have a better sense of all of the information that we're gonna be covering today. So we are gonna begin with talking about the University of Maryland four-year housing plan. What does that look like? What does that mean for all of the students that are here joining us today? We'll also take a look at all the residence halls that we have. You'll get a chance to learn some of the different areas of campus and what residence halls are located um, in those different areas. We'll also talk about South Campus Commons and the courtyards. These are what we lovingly refer to as our P3, our public 
private partnerships. And then we'll also go through room selection. What does that look like? What is this process about? What are those deadlines? And then we'll uh, close with questions uh, that you should consider talking with as um, a family member or as a chirp yourself talking with your family. And then lastly, we'll get to share some resources. So if you continue to have questions or want to seek more information, we'll point you to the right direction on where you can go from there. And then uh, as Danny mentioned, we'll also do uh, a Q&A at the end for any last minute questions that weren't answered in the Q&A um, in the Q&A forum or any questions that you guys have thought up along the way. So we'll continue from there and get to know more about our four year housing plan uh, from Tracy. Thanks, Jasmine. It is great to see that we have representation from all levels of um, our students, from rising sophomores to rising seniors. And I am delighted to share with the Department of Resident Life, we have a four-year housing plan. We like to dedicate our residence hall housing um, to those in their first and second years with the university. We have a plethora of housing options from traditional style rooms, to semi-suites, suites, and apartments, which we'll um, tell you more about. And um, we feel for students in their first and second year, we have the support and resources um, available to help students transition and be on the path to graduation. For students who stay on campus in their first and second years, they then have priority leasing opportunities at our public and private partnership apartments, which are the South Campus Commons and the courtyards. Um, and so typically year one and two, you're in the residence halls, years three and four, you're in commons and courtyards, although we do have both juniors and seniors living on campus. And we'll talk a little bit more about that process. The best way to have priority for commons and courtyards is to stay on campus. Now, before we launch into our um, video that will showcase all of the reasons our rising sophomores should stay on campus, I would like to just reinforce that um, there is no reason to rush your housing decisions for the fall 2025, spring 2026 academic year. I know that um, some students are beginning to feel pressure. They're hearing about all of the off-campus um, leasing opportunities that are happening. Um, but I would like to say, take a deep breath, pause. There is no rush. There is plenty of inventory. And you will learn through this presentation that the on-campus process um, begins in November and extends through February. And so although your student may say, I need to sign a lease today or students who are on the call, you're feeling that pressure, it is okay to pause. You're in a transition time. You are still adjusting to campus. You're making your friends, um, friendships and connections. You're deciding student groups to join. Today is not the day to pick your housing for next August. Okay, let's roll that video, friends. All right, and now it's my turn to start uh, presenting to you. Once again, my name is Linda. 
Um, our resident halls are home to more than 12,000 students. Um, living in the residence halls offers a unique experience of engaging and living with people who are different um, from oneself and provides the opportunity to learn about yourself and others. Um, our students represent a culturally rich and diverse campus uh, we call home with students hailing from 42 states, Washington, D.C., and 48 countries. Um, the Department of Resident Life provides housing options for students during their undergraduate experience. Uh, first and second year students uh, who meet the priority uh, housing deadlines are guaranteed on-campus housing. Uh, students entering their junior and senior years who have lived on campus for the first two years have priority access to our capstone properties, and those are our P3s, uh, South Campus Commons, and the courtyards. Um, our off-campus housing services office also offers support and services for students searching for alternative housing options. Um, the University of Maryland campus is home to 39 on-campus residence halls and to public-private partnerships. Um, again, that's the South Campus Commons in the courtyards. Uh, we are proud to share that 62% of first-year students um, opt to continue their residential experience with us and choose to return in their second year. Um, and I'd like to note that we do not have a live-on requirement, uh, so people are choosing to return. Um, the Maryland Residential Experience provides complete access to all the university has to offer and positions students to be fully immersed in the Terrapin community with support in place. Our housing program is unique uh, from any other College Park housing offers uh, because it's all about the facts. And as you can see on our slide right here, it's friendships and connections. A for academic success, C for convenience and cost, T for 24-7 support, and S for student development. Uh, students who live on the north side of campus uh, live in close proximity to the Epley Recreation Center, uh, the CQ Stadium, and the Xfinity Center, as well as the Clarice, uh, that is our Performing Arts Center. Additionally, there are two dining halls, uh, that would be Yahimitsi and uh, the 251 North in the Denton community. Um, students will be able to form groups of four during room selection to shop for available semi-suites in Oakland Hall. Uh, Oakland Hall also has a small number of double rooms. Additionally, there are traditional double rooms located in the Denton, Ellicott, Heritage, and Cambridge community. Um, a large percentage of returning students will live on the south side of campus. Um, the South Hill community, or the communities on South Campus are North Hill, South Hill, and Leonardtown. Um, the South Hill community uh, consists primarily of suites with some apartments. The Leonardtown community consists of only apartments. Um, so that's a good option for students who wish to cook their own meals. Um, so the difference between suites and apartments is suites do not have kitchens, apartments do. Uh, in the North Hill community, Prince Frederick Hall offers double rooms and semi-suites for students who participate in the digital cultures create and creativity, ACES, and interdisciplinary business honors living and learning programs. Um, students looking for single rooms will find them in Wacomico, Carroll, and Caroline Halls. Uh, Carroll Hall is also our substance-free residence hall. Uh, so students will be able to shop in group sizes of up to six to fill apartments or suites. Groups of four will be able to fill semi-suites. Um, once again, to uh, just repeat, uh, the difference between apartments and suites is that apartments come equipped with a kitchen. Um, students uh, or sorry, suites and apartments have at least one bathroom. Uh, Semi-suites are defined as two double rooms connected by a bathroom. Uh, so here we, you know, might want to hold on this for just a second so everybody can take a screenshot or a photo because this is some important information. Um, we encourage students and families to check out our 360 virtual room tours on the Res Life website. Uh, you can view several room layouts, including double rooms, 
um, in apartments and suites and various other residence halls or across campus. Um, they're, you know, a good representation of what you might be seeing um, if you choose those spaces. Uh, for our current housing rates, uh, please visit our housing fees page. Again, this is one that you might want to take a screenshot or a picture of. Uh, next year's housing rates will be available in mid to late spring, but this is a decent reference for kind of where, what the costs are this semester, this academic year rather. Um, we have differential housing rates, uh, which are based on the residence hall, room amenities offered, and the number of room occupants. Um, and that is occupancy, occupancy within the bedroom. So uh, double in an apartment means the bedroom in the apartment as a whole has two people in it. And I'll hand this over to Tiffany so she can give you a little bit of information about South Campus Commons and Courtyards. Hello, good afternoon. Tiffany Gaines Oquemme, Associate Director for University Housing Partnerships. So I'm here to talk about our uh, two properties, South Campus Commons and the Courtyards. They are also known as our Public-Private Partnerships, or P3s. Um, this means that they were built on university land, uh, but managed by an outside management company, and that company is called Capstone On-Campus Management or like we like to call them COCM. Uh, management oversees the facilities and getting students into the beds and resident life over at South Campus Commons, we manage the staff. So we have res life staff, um, RAs, resident directors, and a community director. They're all staff um, of the university. At the courtyards or CTY, uh, their setup is a little different. All employees, whether they're students um, or not, are COCM employees. However, all RAs at both of the properties are trained on the same materials. Um, the properties came to be as the university was in need of housing for upperclassmen. So South Campus Commons and the courtyards is the place where rising juniors and seniors have priority or in the halls they may not. Next slide. Okay, so we have pictures of our two properties here. It'll tell you the total number of students. Um, and looking at CTY, it's located on the more northern side of campus. Um, and it's actually located right off of Route 193. Um, this property is garden style and has a number of very nice amenities, um, such as a newly renovated clubhouse, community fitness center, um, as well as their units are very spacious. They have balconies, a pool, and free parking on the property for leaseholders. Um, should a student be a leaseholder and want to park on campus, they then would need to purchase a parking pass. South Campus Commons is located on South Campus and can be found uh, nestled amongst the other South Campus residence halls. Um, these buildings are more like your traditional apartment building. Um, they have long hallways, units off the halls, elevators, lobbies, etc. cetera. Um, and parts of South Campus Commons are located near downtown College Park, as well as other South Campus residence halls. Um, South Campus Commons is very popular with students. Uh, please note that when you complete the application, um, there is one application for both sites, and you can select what site you're going to live at. There is one application. Okay, next slide. Okay, so we're talking about our apartment selection eligibility and priority. <clears throat> priority is given to on-campus residence hall students who are rising juniors or rising seniors based on the number of semesters they've been in college after graduating from high school. Credits are not considered in their priority status. Because commons and courtyards were built to help provide additional housing for on-campus upperclassmen, that means rising juniors and rising seniors, they get first and second priority at both properties when selecting. They are also the only group of students that can be pulled in by current residents. 
we are very strict with our priority order when it comes to apartment selection for the commons and the courtyards. To be eligible, a student must be in good standing, both judicially and academically. They also must be registered for the spring semester. A question that we get often um, is, let's say a student is coming to the institution for the fall 25, um, those students aren't eligible to participate in apartment selection. However, there are often students that sign leases during apartment selection and then aren't able to keep those leases for whatever reason. So many transfer students end up taking over those leases from students um, that picked during apartment selection. Students get appointments for selection based on their priority and appointments are random. So it doesn't matter when you complete your application as long as it's before the deadline, which is February 6th. The leasing application opens on November 11th. So anyone that completes their application between November 11th, February 16th by 11.59 p.m. will keep their priority. This is very important. <clears throat> anyone who misses the deadline will lose their priority. So it is very important that students that wish to try to live in commons or courtyards get their applications in on time. Most of the application is already pre-populated, so the process is very easy. And in saying that, that is why we do not accept any late applications. There are absolutely no exceptions to this. Uh, another thing to note, we get a lot of questions about, um, let's say if a student lives on campus for the fall and moves off campus in the spring, for the next the fall semester, they will be in the last priority group. The last priority group is for all campus students and those that live in our fraternity and sorority houses because they are not part of our residence hall system. But if we have a student, let's say that lived on campus in the fall and studied abroad for the spring, we'd treat them as though they were currently living on campus. Next slide. All right. Okay. Um, so the chart is a quick comparison from last year's rates. Um, the courtyard you can see is one of the most affordable places to reside in in College Park and Commons is another more affordable option compared to the other off-campus properties. Um, and these are just some of the reasons why these two properties are in high demand. Um, we like to give a little plug for the courtyards. Um, in past years, Commons tended to fill more quickly, but last year, uh, courtyards did. Um, and just to give a little plug, again, very affordable, large rooms on site parking, um, and it's located right across 193. Um, let's see. In order to further educate students on commons and courtyards, uh, we'll be hosting a number of info sessions, um, specifically to answer questions regarding commons and courtyards. Um, and those info sessions will be led by one of the staffers um, in the University Housing Partnerships, as well as a member of the uh, current Commons and Courtyards Management Team. Um, these sessions are gonna be starting um, in November. Um, and to find more information, um, I will put this information in the chat uh, so that you all can see when those info sessions will be. Thank you. Wonderful. Now that we've learned all about our housing options, we're going to dive into room selection within the residence halls. So room selection is uh, the process for students to choose a space to live in within the residence halls and to stay on with us for another year, which we hope you will do, you must log into the housing portal and complete the residence uh, hall housing and dining agreement by February 24th at 4 p.m.
students can begin applying for this uh, on November 10th at 9 a.m. And this applies to every student that's seeking on-campus housing, including rising juniors and seniors. And if an eligible student meets the deadline and currently lives on campus, then they're guaranteed to return to campus living, campus housing for another year. And this is regardless whether you are a rising sophomore or a junior or a senior. And that's really, really great news to know that your housing would be settled for for next academic year. So if you can, go ahead and check this one off your list after considering all of the different options. You can go ahead and begin applying, uh, as I mentioned, on November 10th. And you can have your housing all ready and squared away in November. And we understand, again, how busy students are and how busy uh, families families are, so it's a really helpful thing to know that your housing will be settled for next year already in November. So we really encourage you all to, again, consider all of the housing options, and when you're ready, begin uh, to submit your residence hall housing and dining agreement beginning on November 10th. We'll also have another slide um, further down with all of the different timelines and deadlines. So if you didn't catch this one already, we will again reiterate it in another slide um, to make sure that those uh, important deadlines are on your radar. So I'll turn it over to Linda to talk a little bit more about room selection in that process. Okay, so room selection, um, after you sign up for on-campus housing, um, once room selection opens, and that will be after February 24th, uh, the next step is getting your selection appointment. Um, at that point, once you know when you'll be selecting, you'll be able to begin forming groups uh, and start strategizing with your group uh, what building, community, and or types of rooms that you and your group would like to choose. Um, eligible students can choose a space as an individual or as part of a group. Um, the, those who are in groups can create group sizes from two to six, elect a group leader, and then the group the space at their appointed time. The great news is that this is a live process. So students are controlling or are, are in control of their housing selection. There's no waiting. Um, we'll provide more detail uh, about the process during the spring semester. Here is a, another one you should take a screenshot and I'll be handing it over to Jasmine. Thanks, Linda. Um, just as I mentioned, again, another deadline here. We really encourage everyone to apply for housing by February 24th at 4 p.m. And after a student chooses a room, then that becomes their space for the academic year 2025-2026. And there will be an opportunity to, to change a room um, after room selection has been completed. However, we do want to remind uh, families and students um, that as part of your housing and dining agreement, um, you agree to the terms and conditions. Um, and while you will be able to request a housing cancellation um, or a buyout, that is only applicable in certain situations. So we really encourage you all to be um, very thoughtful about the rooms that you select and be sure that they're a really good fit for your needs and for your preferences for the upcoming academic year. Now, we expect to offer housing to all current um, students who meet this deadline, so please don't wait and be sure to apply for housing by February 24th at 4 p.m. So we have shared a lot of information with you, and there's more to come, but what we're hoping is that you have the initial intel you need to start having some really good conversations with either your TERP or your family about what your housing options are. And I think um, that it's most important when you jumpstart these conversations that you're thinking about what are your housing preferences, what needs do you have, and where will where might be the best fit for you. And one of the very first conversations you should be discussing is what makes the most sense in terms of the differences between on-campus housing, which are academic year terms, housing when you need it, when classes are in session, versus the full year lease. And what that means for you and your family and 
and your student if you enter into a full year lease. Um, and then naturally, um, the basics. If you have an apartment, how will you eat? Will you have a meal plan? Um, versus if you're on campus and not living in an apartment, you're on a meal plan. Um, how might you go back and forth to campus to get to classes and student group um, activities and events and programs and the various resources that um, are offered here at the University of Maryland. So there's a lot of things to consider and these questions give you that launch pad to talk about those things. Okay, and one more uh, as, as shot you might want to take a screenshot for. Um, so the timeline I'll go through uh, for the residence halls right now. Um, so November 10th, 2024, the residence hall application will be available. So it's the housing and dining agreement. You don't have to select anything on that form. Your TERP can just fill it out, say, yes, I want housing and it's done. So we always encourage students when they have, you know, five, 10 minutes to sit down, submit the form, and then you at least know that you are guaranteed on-campus housing at that point. Um, February 24th, 2025 at 4 p.m. is the deadline, and that is a hard deadline. So um, students must submit their agreement by that time. That's why we say you know, if you have November 11th and you have five minutes between your classes, go ahead, submit the form, get it done with, and then you don't have to worry about it until uh, March 3rd, which is when the residence hall room selection process begins. Um, so March 3rd through the 10th, uh, 2025, students will be selecting rooms. Uh, there will be a lot more information about that when we get closer to those dates. If we're looking at the timeline at the very bottom, you'll see this um, is in reference to the commons in the courtyards. Um, so I stated before, um, the application will open November 11th. Remember, there is one application that you will be filling out and that will have you apply to both properties and then you will select which one you want to live at. Um, you want to have your application in by February 6, 2025 at 11.59 p.m. This is a hard and fast deadline. Um, and if things are uh, submitted after that, you'll lose your priority as I uh, mentioned before. Um, we'll have actual unit selection for those moving into the property February 19th and 20th. And then we are looking to have all of the leases signed by February 24th, 2025 at 12 p.m. Alrighty, now we know that we have given you a ton of information today. Um, and as Linda has been urging, please go ahead and take a picture of this um, page with a bunch of resources that you can turn to should you continue to have questions specifically about residence halls. You can reach out to ResLife um, at umd.edu if you have questions specifically about commons or our other off-campus housing services. These are the best uh, contacts to reach out to with those questions and even just additional information to, again, better inform you of the decision um, of where you should um, apply for housing for next year. We have a ton of information and our staff is really dedicated to providing you with the answers, with the insight, um, so that you can make the best um, informed decision that you can for yourself and for your TERP. Um, so I'll leave this up for just a, a moment here so folks can take a picture and, and refer to these resources as they're beginning to, again, have those conversations and really figure out where is the best, um, what's the best housing option for me. Alrighty, so hopefully you've taken a picture of that.
And next, now before we move on to taking questions, any additional questions that y'all might have, we did want to share an opportunity for students to check out uh, what South Campus Living is all about. We're going to be providing tours uh, about all the South Campus housing options that are available to students on Friday, October 25th. So that's coming up just two days from now, uh, from one to five. This is information that's been shared with our students currently, but we did and of course, want to plug it again so folks can see, um, really be able to see in person what these living spaces look like, what are these options again. Um, so that will be available for folks to participate in this Friday uh, from 1 to 5. Great, so one more plug, because this is the most important date if you're, you and your TERP are considering the residence halls. They must submit their housing and dining agreement by February 24th, 2025 at 4 p.m. to be eligible to participate in the room selection process. There are no um, um, implications for submitting an agreement and it, and then if they choose not to participate in, room, participate in room selection, that is okay. There's no penalties. But in order to have the option to be considered for room selection, they must submit their agreement. The same is true for the commons and courtyards leasing process. Students may also submit a leasing agreement and a residence hall housing and dining agreement. Um, so hopefully we've made that clear. We are going to move into the Q&A portion, and those of us behind the scenes are still feverishly um, trying to answer some of the questions in the Q&A. We hope you have enjoyed the presentation. Thank you all so much. So I have been uh, br uh, browsing the questions. So I have some questions that I'm going to uh, ask live continue to submit questions in the Q&A, uh, and I will uh, feed those to some of our uh, panelists as well. Uh, the first question I wanna ask, is there a benefit to submitting the housing and dining agreement earlier, uh, closer to the November time when it opens versus later in the spring? Um, and is there any advantage to submitting the housing application uh, earlier rather than later? everyone hear me? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> um, I'm behind the scenes here, but my name is Gloa Yushi, her pronouns. I'm the um, housing and assignment processes, the assignments and housing processes manager here. So um, the answer to this question is uh, around benefits and advantages to submitting the application. There is no benefit to submitting it early. Um, it's really one of those situations where um, the benefit is getting a peace of mind and knowing that your housing is all set for next year. You could take a breather, um, but it does not put you at any advantage when it comes to your placement or the selection of your space. Thank you. Uh, and then also regarding the agreements, uh, if a student fills out the residence hall housing and dining agreement, uh, are they bound to stay on campus? Uh, and will they be penalized or lose any deposits? There is um, no deposit when submitting the returning students hall housing and dining agreement. That is only for new incoming first year students, which is a $50 non-refundable fee. Um, there's lots of information and resources that will come for new and incoming first year students. This was mostly, this webinar was geared more towards the audience of our returning families. Um, so yes, there's no fee for returning students and you can cancel the agreement without penalty um, by April 1st of the 2025 year, so in the spring. Um, however, if you miss the deadline of the February 24th, then it is likely um, that you will be placed on the wait list and will only receive an opportunity for residence hall housing after we've been able to accommodate rising sophomores and first year students. 
So as Tracy has said, Jasmine has said, Linda, so many of my colleagues here have shared, it is best to keep your options open, submit that agreement um, beginning November 10th um, so that you can actually have an opportunity to participate in room selection. Uh, and again, uh, speaking about room selection, uh, we will have a webinar specifically on room selection. So we'll be sharing more information with you all uh, as we get closer to that, that time period. Uh, another question uh, that came through, uh, can students living in the P3 properties uh, or the on-campus apartments, can they purchase uh, meal plans? And are they the same plans that students may have if they're living in the traditional residence halls? Yes, they can purchase meal plans um, and dining offers an apartment um, dining plan. Thank you. Uh, and for folks, if you want more information about that, the more specifics and costs uh, on the dining services website, so dining.umd.edu, you'll be able to find more information uh, about that there. Uh, there was another question that, or a lot of questions came through about uh, shuttle services to off-campus properties, our P3 properties. Uh, the shuttle UM system is amazing. Um, there, they have their own website on the transportation services website. Uh, the website is transportation.umd.edu. Uh, there's a tab at the top that says shuttle UM. Uh, and so you can go on there. You can see all of the different uh, routes that they have. There's a transit app that students will download. And that's what they use to see where the shuttles are, what time they're supposed to arrive, uh, all of that information. So transportation services website, uh, and you'll be able to look up Shuttle UM, and that's the shuttle service that will take students uh, throughout campus, but also to many off-campus uh, properties as well. Um, let's see, uh, the next question, uh, if my student moves off campus, can they return to the residence halls or South Campus Commons or courtyards the following year? Um, and how do you handle off-campus housing uh, when students either attend, uh, a, attend an institution abroad or study abroad and then want to come back to campus and live on campus. Danielle, can you break that up for me? What was the first part of the question? Yes. So um, if a student moves off campus, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a, a fraternity or sorority house uh, or just another off-campus property, uh, can they return on campus the following year to either a residence hall or South Campus Commons or Courtyards? I can speak for Commons and Courtyards. If a student moves off campus and they wish to return, they can try, but they will be in the last priority group because they moved off campus. So they'll be an off-campus student trying to come back to Commons and Courtyards. So they will be in the last priority group because they will be an off-campus student or if they're coming from our fraternities and sororities, they'll be in the last priority group because those are not a part of the residents, uh, the resident life um, housing, uh, housing group. And then what was the second question? Uh, is that the same for students who study abroad? So they're studying abroad for a semester and then when they come back, uh, how is their priority handled? For commons and courtyards, if a student studies abroad, we look at that student as if they are currently living on campus. And that is the same for residence halls. We just simply ask that our students um, communicate this with us, um, but it's treated very much so the same. Great, thank you. Um, I saw this on a slide, I believe, but um, I'm not sure if it was touched on. Uh, are students of different genders allowed to live together, um, either in the residence halls or in the P3 properties? Yeah, in the residence halls, students can form mixed gender groups of four to six to select either the South um, Hill Suites, apartments, Leonardtown, and or some of the Summy Suites in Oakland or Prince Frederick if they're in the living learning programs that um, Linda listed prior um, in Prince Frederick. But yes, it is a possibility um, in the residence halls for suites and apartments and semi-suites.
I needed to answer to, didn't I, Danielle? <laughs> yes, I was just about to ask for the P3 properties. I'm sorry, say again. For the P3 properties, uh, can students select to um, live in mixed Oh, gender? yes, we have a we have a mixed gender um, uh, leasing process that we go through. Um, so you would want to visit um, our uh, Res Life website, look under, um, oh, I think it's housing options, and you'll find a timeline uh, for the processes that are in Commons, and there is a mixed gender process for those students that are interested. Thank you. Uh, are there events planned for students to meet potential roommates? Yeah. Yeah. I would say for our residence halls, we have, um, stay tuned for more information about some upcoming roommate socials or roommate mixers, as we like to call them. Um, we're aiming for February 2025, so stay tuned for those dates. Um, you can find all of this information on our website at reslife.com umd.edu once it is available. It's also on the screen right now. Um, we have a couple of tabs between our stay on tab um, that'll share this information. Um, our room selection tab will also be sharing this information in addition to, as Danielle mentioned earlier, the room selection workshop. So we have a couple of things early spring um, that we have planned to help our students, you know, form these groups, create create um, larger groups um, in order to find the sense of belonging and what they're looking for to stay on with us next year. I also know between my staff and Capstone staff, they also are preparing uh, like a roommate mixer for students to come um, talk with each other, engage in different activities to try to find roommates as well. Thank you. Uh, this next question is regarding uh, ADA accommodations and accessibility. Uh, so if students currently have accommodations in place, uh, do they need to submit a new request for the next uh, year or will those accommodations stay in place uh, until they say they no longer need them? If you already have an approved accommodation um, with the Accessibility and Disability Services Office for a housing accommodation, that sticks with you as long as you live in, in the residence halls. Um, you don't have to reapply um, or do anything differently. Um, if you have not applied for a housing accommodation, however, you should do so. Um, I would say as soon as possible, they are still accepting applications with our Accessibility and Disability Services Office. Um, once they approve that request, they will let us know um, what accommodation your student um, or you, you yourself was approved for. Um, and then we will reach out to the student with their options. Um, let me see. Um, something that's very important to note, if you do get approved for accommodation, it does not transfer over to your friend. That accommodation is yours, so it's not for you and your roommate. Um, so if you do have an accommodation for next year, you choose to live with your friends um, and not your accommodation, that may be an option. Um, but I would say that's a, a communication that we can have when the time comes. Um, but just want to let you know it does not transfer over to the roommate or your roommate group um, that you created for room selection. That accommodation is only yours and yours alone. Great. And if the oh. student is looking to trans, uh, go from the residence halls over to either commons or courtyards, they will be required to resubmit their documentation. They will be submitting their documentation to COC and management as a member of their staff is the one that does ADS accommodations for the properties. Thank you. Uh, renter's insurance. Um, do residents in the residence halls need to have renter's insurance? And then also for Tiffany you as well, for our P3 properties, uh, do they need to have renter's insurance? We would say yes, they need renter's insurance. Please, please do not overlook the importance of renter's insurance. Unfortunately, unforeseen things happen, um, but we want to make sure if there is an incident, a student can 
um, get their items replaced. So I will say for court commons and courtyards, we always tell students getting um, uh, renter's insurance is, is highly, highly suggested. And then for on-campus housing? I was going to say that's not something we emphasize here. Um, I don't know if any of my other colleagues want to chime in on that, but um, it's one of those things that it's good to have, but we do not emphasize or highly suggest renter's insurance in our halls or for our halls. Thank you. Uh, and then another question that I've been seeing uh, a lot is uh, regarding priority groups. So. If there's a group of students, if they're in different uh, class years, so they have different priority levels, how is the priority level for that group determined? It will be the last the last person. So for instance, let's say we have one, one junior, two seniors, and an off-campus student. They will all go with the off-campus student. They will go with the last... Um, the, the person in the last group, because remember the other students, rising juniors and rising seniors have priority. So if you are not a rising junior or rising senior, you're going to go in that priority group with um with the, with the other, I don't know how to describe it really, let me see. So you have all different groups. So you have, let's say two juniors, a senior and an off-campus person because we think of um, leasing or priority as a line, if you are not in one of those priority groups, those that are in the priority group, if they want to be with someone in a different one, they will go to that other person's priority group. So all, th all three of us might be rising juniors, but we want, we want to live with Nicole and she's off campus. We all will go during Nicole's um, time because Nicole cannot jump the line ahead of other rising juniors, rising seniors that live on campus. Nicole, was that was that clear? I know I know priority can be a little confusing. If people have specific questions, you know, they can always reach out to the office. Um, but yeah, if you are in different groups, remember the priority is for rising juniors and rising seniors. So if you all are not in that group, you will go to the back of the line back later time. Great, thank you. Um, I do, I have one other question and then I will give time for uh, the panelists and those working behind the scenes to uh, uh, respond to anything live if they want. I know that we're at an hour now. Um, so if you do need to hop off, feel free. We'll be on for maybe another like few minutes. Um, but we'll make sure that uh, these questions get answered um, on the back end as well. Uh, my last question would be regarding uh, living learning programs. Uh, so if a student is part of a living learning program and they've been assigned a certain residence hall or a certain floor, uh, are they able to stay on that floor or in that residence hall for the next year? Um, or do, like, do they have priority for that space? Or is it just you're in the priority level next year for what you are. And if you just so happen to get that space again, you just so happen to get that space. How does that work? It's more of the latter, Danielle. Um, if you are a participant of a living learning program, um, you will be, this is more geared towards room selection. You will have a separate time and date dedicated. There's a separate time and date dedicated for um, living learning program participants. So there's no guarantee you'll be in that same exact um, space. Um, so same exact room, room 511, um, but you would um, if given the opportunity and you were eligible because you weigh, you are a rising sophomore, for example, um, you can select to live in the on the floor or in the hall in which your living learning program is housed. Hope that Claire answers that question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much uh, for those of you answering questions um, in the Q and A. Is there anything that you want to cover live before we before we wrap up? Oh. 
Okay. Uh, so I will go ahead and wrap us up. There will still be folks answering questions in the Q&A. Uh, and we will uh, take these. I will pull a report. I'll make sure that we get um, answers to these. And I will share them with the recording of the webinar. Uh, so thank you all for taking time with us this afternoon. Uh, contact information for Resident Life is here on this last slide. So you'll see reslife.umd.edu. That's where you can reach them. Uh, so please feel free to reach out if you do have any questions. Uh, as I bring this webinar to a close, I do want to remind you all again, this webinar has been recorded uh, and will be available on the Turk Family YouTube channel uh, later today or early tomorrow. Uh, you'll also receive an email with a link to the recording as well as a survey. Uh, so please let us know how we did, uh, how we can improve on the webinars and any other topics you would uh, be interested in learning more about. Uh, within the description for the YouTube video, I will... Uh, in a couple of days, once we have time to review all of the questions and, and get that presented in a nice way, I'll link the questions in the description of the YouTube video. So if you weren't able to see a response to your question, just give us a couple of days. We'll have that uh, in the description of the YouTube video. So again, thank you all so much for joining us today. I hope this was really helpful. You're feeling a little more prepared for uh, finding housing for next year. Um, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you all so much.